Well, welcome again to another Friday night. And tonight I want to start a new series. And it's a series that's on the lies that people believe who come out of complex trauma that prevent them from growing, that sabotage their recovery, that sabotage growth that they already have. And I think it's important on many levels, but to me, part of recovery, there's a cognitive piece. There's learning a whole bunch of truth about yourself, about life, how it works, about your patterns, self-awareness. But there's also a cognitive piece of beginning to understand the lies that you've been operating from and replacing them with the truth. And that's why some people refer to recovery as a, the mind is a battlefield. Because there's a war that goes on in that mind about what to believe. And so this, in my mind, is going to be an important series for many of you as you be begin or continue on your journey in recovery and become more aware of the lies that sabotage your recovery. So just let me say this at the very beginning. If you're an addict, you know that addiction is all about telling yourself lies and believing lies. If you come out of complex trauma and have been in recovery for a while, you know that there's a lot of lies that you believe, thousands of them, but many of them you're not even aware of. They've been operating at a subconscious level since you were a child, and they have really messed up how you cope, how you relate to others, how you think. It's a very lie-filled world. Somebody has said that the greatest sources of our suffering are the lies that we tell ourselves. And so we're going to look at this subject, and I want to tell you up front that dealing with lies is easier said than done. It's easy to identify lies once you become aware of them, but there's a lot of resistance that kicks in as soon as you start to want to change them, and a lot of fear comes up as soon as you want to replace a lie with the truth. So what we're going to see is a big part of recovery is this battlefield <coughs> in the mind where you're replacing lies with the truth. Somebody else has said that, Recovery involves transforming our thinking. And I think that's a great way of looking at it. Now, it's not the only piece of recovery. It's just one piece, but it's a very important piece. So if you're not quite sure just where I'm going with this or what this lie thing is all about, let me just give you an example from addiction so that you can understand some of what we're talking about so what we said is addiction is all about telling lies and believing lies. But think of it this way. In addiction, the drug or alcohol starts out as being your very best friend. It takes you out of your pain. It gives you pleasure. It enables you to feel alive. It helps you cope. It helps you forget about your terrible life. All of those things make it, in the beginning days, your very best friend. But after a while, it starts to turn on you and becomes your greatest enemy. But your brain doesn't want to believe that yet. And so even though you yourself know that you're lying to yourself, you still tell yourself some of these lies. I can have just one. I can control it. You know that's not true but you still believe it. It's a lie. Or, I'll use, but I won't let anybody see it. And so it won't affect anybody but me. It won't affect my kids if they don't see it. That's a lie. Or, I've been fighting this craving for days. It's getting so difficult to fight it. Maybe if I just give in, it'll make it go away, and then I can get back on with being healthy. So the solution to the craving is just to give in and stop. And you know that's a lie. Or life in sobriety or 
being clean has become so full of responsibility, routine, boredom. It feels like drudgery some days. I need a break. So I'll just use a relapse as a short vacation from my stress-filled life, and then I'll come back and engage in it again. You know, that's a lie. Or I've always been able to lie about the fact that I've used or wiggle out of my consequences after I use. So it's not really a big deal whether I use or not. I can always finesse my way out of it. Or the way to stop my addiction problems is I just need more information. I don't need to change anything in my life. I just need to understand more. That'll fix it. And then I've even had some people say, I relapse and I relapse and I relapse. I just can't stay clean. Maybe God intended for me to be an addict. All of those are subtle lies that take place within addiction. And that's only one small area. But it gives you an idea of what we're talking about. So for today, I want to just give you a foundation around lies and what sets us up to believe lies, how complex trauma plays into all of this stuff. So let's begin with, how does a child develop a belief system? So believing a lie or believing the truth, both of those are a belief system. It's what you choose to believe. And so what happens for a lot of people is they choose to believe the lie They might tell themselves it's the truth, but it becomes part of their belief system. So there's a whole bunch of pieces that play a part in determining what we believe about life, about ourselves, about relationships, about coping, all of those things. So number one, the people in authority in our lives teach us. So they tell us what is the truth. It might be a lie, but they tell us it's the truth. And so you might have a father that says, never let people see you cry, only weak people cry. And you believe that, that if you cry, you're weak. And that becomes part of your belief system. Or your family might say, you only need family. You don't need anybody else. Families are always there for each other. Now that's got a lot of problems in it, but as a child, you don't see that it's a lie. And so you adopt it and believe it, and it becomes part of how you approach problems in life. So what we are taught by those in authority over us has a lot of weight in determining what we believe. Secondly, the role models of those closest to us. So if you have parents who are workaholics, and they work, 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 you begin to believe that being a workaholic is a healthy thing. It's a good thing. It's the way a person person should live. Or if you have a parent who's always angry, you're learning about anger from them. And some of what you will learn will be lies. Or if you have a parent who's full of anxiety and fears, it will affect you and you will believe at some level, usually subconscious, that you need to be afraid of those things as well. So you just pick up on their role model. They may not say anything to you, but you observe it. And then if you have a parent that's always complaining, always negative, always critical, then you, that shapes what you believe. Or if they're blaming everybody for their problems, that shapes what you believe. Then you watch how they cope when they're under stress. You watch how they go about relationships, how they interact with others, and that shapes what you believe about coping and about relationships. So there are millions of things in there that you're gradually learning as a child that you are incorporating into your belief system. Then beyond that, 
is your parents' value system. So what is it that they value in their life? So it could be money. It could be the car. It could be some other possessions. Those are their value systems. Or you begin to see that they're all about partying. Or they are big. Sex is a big part of what is important to them. Those all shape what you then believe about all of those things, about what is important in life. And then, they may not value some things that they should value. So they may not value connection with people. Or they may not value a spiritual component to life. And you learn from them. You adopt their beliefs because of their value system. You gradually pick it up without them saying a thing. Then, what you get validated for. So if you get validated for your brains or your body, your beauty, you walk, that affects what you believe about yourself. And you say, my greatest asset is my body. My greatest asset is my brain. That's what gives me value. And so that greatly affects your belief system. Or if everybody loves you because you're a very funny person, and they want to hang around you all the time because of the stories you tell, then that affects how you view yourself, that your greatest asset is your sense of humor. So that's a distorted view of yourself. It's a lie, but you believe it because that's what you get validated for. And then experience teaches you. So you put your hand on a hot stove element and get burnt. And you learn a lesson. You, it teaches you don't touch a hot stove. Or you share something with your mom. Very personal. And then you find out she's blabbed it to all of her friends. And to the other family members. And what did you learn? Don't share stuff that's personal. People will not keep a con confidence. So you have thousands and thousands of experiences growing up. And from each one you learn lessons that shape what you believe. Then you have a conscience. Something that's an alarm system that tells you when you violate love. So you tell a lie and it bugs you. You <clears throat> are mean to your sibling and it bugs you. And from that you get pointers on how to live. Now you can choose to listen to your conscience and learn from it, or you can choose to ignore it. But also, you can have a conscience that is mistrained. So you can have parents that say, when you express a need, you're being selfish. And that then trains your conscience that every time you feel a need and want to express it, that you're being selfish. And so you learn lessons from that that shape your belief system. And then there's your friends and the culture around us. It gives us teaching every day about how to be happy. A lot of it is lies. About what's important in life. A lot of it is lies. But it has a great influence on us because we want to please our peers, and, and because we're part of a culture. And so those shape us. And then the final one is, all of us have a dark side to some degree. And that dark side pulls us in a direction of wanting to go into certain behaviors. And so we want to use our brain then to justify what we know is wrong. And so we choose to create lies to tell ourselves to justify doing what we know is wrong. So all of those things shape our belief system. So let me bring in complex trauma. Because it has a profound negative effect on the shaping of our belief system. It basically makes us think that most of the lies of life are the truth. It gives us a very distorted, lie-filled belief system 
that we're not even aware of. So let me explain. So what we said, first thing that shapes our belief system is what we're told by our authority figures. So what happens in complex trauma, in severe cases of abuse, kid is told, you're useless, you're a failure, you can't do anything right, you'll never amount to anything, you're such a burden, and they believe it. And that shapes their view of self. Or they get told, you're fat, you're ugly, and they're teased and laughed at. And they believe it. And that becomes a belief. Or you're selfish. You only think of yourself. And they believe it. So they get told many lies. Many hurtful things about themselves. And they believe it. And then the second thing was role models. So what happens within complex trauma? <clears throat> you have a parent who's being selfish all the time. You have a parent who values his car more than his kids, his job more than his kids, his buddy more than his kids, his own comfort more than anybody else's. And they're absorbing all of that as they live within that home. So they pick up the unhealthy value system, the unhealthy priorities, the unhealthy beliefs, the unhealthy ways of coping and relating from their parents. And most of it is negative, and it leads to a whole bunch of lies. What about what they learn from experience? So I call this the 2 plus 2 equal 5. So think of this. A child comes into the world wanting to be authentic. They're just themselves. So their personality comes out. Their emotions come out. And they get punished for that. They get made fun of for that. And so what do they conclude? Every time I was authentic, it resulted in pain. Every time I showed my emotions or my personality, it resulted in pain. Therefore, if every case in my history says authenticity equal pain, that'll be the truth moving forward. If I ever am authentic today, it will result in pain. Or if a child cried as a kid and they were punished in shame, they go, <clears throat> I cannot cry today. Because my history says 100% of the time, crying equals pain. Therefore, moving forward, crying equals pain. And so they get a very distorted thing about life, about living. And then... For many people, as children, they're not able to resolve unmet needs. They're not able to resolve painful emotions, conflict. They try and they get shut down. They get punished. And so what they have to do in order to survive is numb their emotional world, medicate it, avoid it. And so every example from their history says Painful emotions cannot be resolved. The only solution is to numb. So now moving forward, I believe that painful emotions cannot be resolved. The only solution is to numb. That makes sense. That seems right because of their history. And that sets up hundreds and hundreds of beliefs that are actually lies. And then complex trauma Validated for the wrong things. Not validated for who they are as a person, but validated because they're such a good helper. Validated because they're so smart. Validated because they're so pretty. Validated because they're bad. And those then shape their beliefs about themselves. All negative. And then, because of the authorities in their life that have been neglectful, abusive, that have abandoned them, some get to the place where they go, I don't trust authority, so I'm not going to believe anything people say. So even if it's the truth, I don't care. I'm going to do the opposite. And so that shapes a belief system. And then they suppress their conscience because <clears throat> their conscience is bothering them, but they can't resolve it. And so they don't want to feel constant guilt, so they turn their conscience off 
and just do whatever they want. So that teacher is gone. And then they can't resolve painful emotions, so they numb them. So now emotions can't guide them. Emotions now misguide them. They're not good guides. So somebody said this, if the truth of our life is too painful to live with and it can't be resolved, then use our brain not to discover truth, but to find ways to deny truth. In other words, the brain is created to discover truth. But if the truth that you are finding is so painful, then let's use our brain to create lies so that we can survive. And that is what happens. And then somebody else said this, if telling the truth results in being punished or hurt, lies make it necessary to survive. So in many complex trauma homes, you don't tell the truth. That'll get you in trouble. So you learn to lie. And then somebody else said, if nobody in the family is concerned about truth or refuses to talk about what is happening, lies and distortions become more valuable in that family. So we talk about the elephant in the room that nobody will talk about. Everybody sees it. But to talk about it, that could have repercussions. That could create conflict. And so we just learn to lie. We learn to distort reality in order to survive. So to me, the tragedy, one of the tragedies of complex trauma is it presents to children a world of lies and distortions as being the truth. And they believe it. And they carry that into their adult life and it governs how they think about themselves, how they go about life, how they go about relationships, and it sets them up to fail. So let me just expand on that a bit more. The consequences of believing lies. So one of the 60 characteristics of complex trauma is that when you live in a world that you have to lie to survive, that lying becomes natural to you. It becomes easier to lie than to tell the truth. And then even when you get older and you're in situations where you don't need to lie any longer, your go-to is still lying. And you lie when it would be just as easy to tell the truth. And so a lot of people, they have a lot of brain space in their heads, <clears throat> keeping track of all the lies that they've told people. It's like they have a file folder for each person and what lies they told that person, what lies they told this person, and they got to keep track of it all. But that becomes their life. But let me take, that, take it further. When you believe lies, when you tell yourself lies, when you lie to others, it damages relationships. It breaks trust. And trust is one of the most important components of a healthy relationship. If it is broken, it is very hard for that relationship to heal. So it has a profound effect on relationships. I think it's important to say that for many people... Lying brought immediate good results. It brought, it got them what they wanted. Or it kept them from getting hurt or punished. It always has immediate good consequences. And so that's why it's easy to reinforce a lie because the immediate consequence was so good. But what you have to understand is that over time, the negative consequences are terrible. Lying always catches up with you. Believing lies always catches up with you. And in time, the consequences are very destructive, are very damaging. I think it's also important to say that for most people, lies operate subconsciously. You're not even aware that you're believing lies. They've always been your normal. 
They've always just been how you go about life. You've never had occasion to challenge them. You just operate by them at a subconscious level. So what gets us to evaluate our life is getting to a place of pain where we start to realize that we are following lies. That makes us stop and start evaluating stuff. And then as we evaluate, <clears throat> we are able to bring the subconscious lies into the conscious world, see them for what they are, and then replace them with the truth. That is part of the journey of recovery. But understand that most lies operate for years at a subconscious level. There's another consequence that comes out of complex trauma in relation to lies. A child believes their parents, those in authority over them. And so when their parents say, you're being selfish, the child at first says, I, don't, I wasn't being selfish. I was just wanting to help. I was just wanting to have my need met. But if my parents said I'm selfish, it must be true. So they learn to twist their brain to accept distortions, to accept lies. And they become very good at it. And so now when anything happens or anybody says something to them, even if their initial gut response is, that's not true, they're able to twist their brain to see it the same way as the person who's saying it to them and to believe it. And so what happens then is you are easily influenceable by somebody else, by somebody who's a lie teller, somebody who distorts reality. So you get in an abusive relationship and they abuse you and say, if you were only nicer to me, if you only did more work around the house, I wouldn't be angry and hit you. And you, your gut says that's not right, but you, you've learned to distort your thinking and you do it again and you, oh yeah, he must be true. I really need to work harder around here and be nicer. And you get sucked into it. And so that happens. And then what's going on with that is you doubt your own perception of reality. You see stuff, but you doubt it. Because you've been trained to doubt. And that makes it easy for somebody then to influence you. And so that sets you up to be attracted to people who will abuse you, who will twist reality, and you're just good at twisting your brain to accept it. Now I need to say something else. Some lies hold great power in people's lives. Some lies hold greater power than others. I think you can see that. But some hold tremendous power. And it's usually from the experiences of childhood that cause the greatest pain. So think of a child who parents neglected them, abused them, told them they were selfish, told them they were a burden, told them they were ugly. And that hurts so much. And so the brain says, okay, you are not good enough. You are useless. You are lazy. You are ugly. And it just burns that into your belief system at a core level. And the brain says, never forget that. Because now you need to create masks all around that to protect you from ever being hurt again. And so that core belief is burned into you with great power. And then the brain builds defenses around that belief so you'll never change it. And so if somebody comes to you and says, you, you have a wonderful personality, I really like you, your brain immediately goes, if they only knew me, they wouldn't have said that. It immediately discounts any positive statement that contradicts that core lie. And so what comes out of complex trauma is the core lie of shame. And I think it's probably the most powerful 
far-reaching lie that comes out of complex trauma, and it totally destroys people's lives. But they have layers of protection around that lie. Now, let's say you've come to see that that shame lie is a lie. And you want to change it. And you want to believe that you have value. That you are now going to stand up for yourself and respect yourself. You know what's going to happen as soon as you start to do that? You're going to have internal resistance. Uh Uh-uh, don't do that. Don't do that. Because you're going to fail and it's going to prove that you're a nobody. And then with that resistance, you're going to have fear. Boy, if if you put yourself out there and stand up for yourself, and then you get proven to be a fraud, you're going to get shamed even worse. So fear kicks in. So when you attempt to change deep lies, expect a lot of resistance. You can know cognitively that that was a lie you were believing, and you can see what the truth is clearly. But to actually fully believe it and change your life to line up with that new truth is very difficult. There are tons of resistance around it. And so what I want you to understand then is that your lies keep you in bondage. They keep you in a prison of self-destruction, of unhealthy relationships. They keep you from growing. They keep you from becoming more healthy, from healing. And so in order to grow and to heal, you have to confront that prison, those lies. And it is a battle. It is very difficult. And what you will find is that you might change and believe the truth for a day or two. And then some stuff will happen and you'll go back to the lie. And you don't even realize you've gone back to the lie. It just happens. It's like a default setting. You don't even, you're not even aware of it. And then you recognize it and you go back to the truth for a few days. And then something else happens and you go back to the lie. And that's what growth looks like as you come out of believing lies. You believe the lie, slide back. Believe the lie, slide back. And that can go on for a long time. But as you continue to believe the truth, you slide back less. And when you do slide back, you don't stay there as long. You're able to see it and get out of it more quickly. So I hope that gives you a a bit of a flavor of what we're going to be looking at over the next couple months as we work through this new series on lies. Okay, that's the end of Part one, we're going to take a short break and then I'm going to come right back and we'll do the Christian part. And if you're not interested in that, again, no problem. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Well, welcome back. What I thought I would do for this week and next is look at lies within our brain and and then understand where we see that very same stuff in the Bible. So when we look at the subject of lies, our cortex believes the lies, but it's often our limbic brain, the emotion center, that adds the fuel to make that lie seem like the truth. So you have our limbic brain, which we talk about all the time, 
That's the child brain. It's what we call the foolish brain. It's the one that believes that a decision is good if it gives me short-term consequences that are good, but it doesn't care about long-term consequences. And it makes decisions based on how it's feeling at any given time. Whereas the cortex is our wise brain, our adult brain, and it makes decisions based on what is healthy, and that is proven by long-term good consequences. So another way to look at that, and it's basically the challenge of healing from complex trauma, is you have a limbic brain that has been messed up. It is no longer a reliable part of the brain. And it is at war with the cortex. It operates by different beliefs than your cortex. And so they're at war all the time. And so we have in psychology called dialectical behavior therapy. And dialectical means opposing forces. And so it's talking about this opposing forces in your brain. A foolish brain against a wise brain. A foolish brain wanting you to go this way. A wise brain saying go on this way. And it fights all the time. So I ask myself, is that in the Bible? And yes, it is. The Bible talks a lot about wisdom and foolishness. And it also talks about the struggle. So Romans 7, and many of you will relate to this, says, I don't really understand myself. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. That constant internal war, Paul is acknowledging. And we all understand it. Proverbs is the book all about wise and foolish. And so, in Proverbs chapter 1, it talks about consequences of living out of the limbic brain or the foolish brain. It says, people that live out of their limbic brain... They hated knowledge. In other words, they hate truth. They follow lies. They chose not to fear the Lord. They rejected my advice. Again, followed lies. Paid no attention when I corrected them. Then listened to their conscience. Then listened to the authorities. Therefore, they must eat the bitter fruit of living their own way. Choking on their own schemes for simpletons turn away from me to death. Fools are destroyed by their own complacency. It is saying right up front in the book, if you live out of your foolish brain, it might look like a good idea right now, but you're going to suffer dire consequences later in your life. So I go, how do I get a wise brain so that it is in charge of my life? What is the path to growing in wisdom into a wise brain? So let me give you just some of the things that Proverbs tells us. In Proverbs 1, it says, Fear the Lord. That is the true foundation of true knowledge. So fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we've looked at this term before, and it just simply means that we need God's perspective on life to be able to make wise decisions. And he sees long-term consequences and he can show us, and he has in the Bible, what healthy living looks like. So to fear the Lord means I respect God and I put more weight in what God says than anybody else. So when he says something's healthy, that's my go-to. That's what I'm going to. To follow. So it starts in a relationship of trusting God's wisdom. And then it says, hang around the right people. Proverbs 1.10. My child, if sinners, those are people that are following their foolish brain, if sinners entice you or try to tempt you to go along with them, turn your back on them. They may say, come and join us. Let's Hide and kill someone. Just for fun, let's ambush the innocent. Think of the great things we'll get 
We'll fill our houses with all the stuff we take. My child, don't go along with them. Stay far away from their paths. So criminal activity, going along with the drug party lifestyle of friends might look exciting and it might look like you're getting away with it. It might look like you're getting richer, but it is going to destroy you down the road. So don't go Along with that, be careful of who your friends are. And then the third, it says you have to apply yourself, commit yourself, give the effort to learn. And this one is so important. You don't just get wisdom by sitting watching TV all the time or playing video games. You have to apply yourself to think, to learn. And so it says, my child, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom. Concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight. Ask for understanding. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. What does it take to find treasures of silver and gold hidden in the earth? A ton of effort. Time. And so it says, Make this your pursuit. Give yourself to learn and ask people, find out. Make this a high priority in your life. Job 28 talks about wisdom as well. And it says, people know where to mine silver and how to refine gold. They know where to dig iron from the earth and how to smelt copper from rock. They know how to shine light in the darkness and explore the farthest reaches of the earth as they search for, in the dark for ore. They sink a mine shaft in the earth far from where anybody lives. They descend on ropes swinging back and forth. So that's what it takes to get gold, ore, a ton of work, going where others haven't gone. And it says you got to do the same. Maximum effort required. Psalm 1, oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. Again, not hanging around with certain people. Stand around with sinners. Join in with mockers, all foolish brain. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. Get to go, know God's word. That's his repository of wisdom. Read it. Think about it. Meditate on it. Go over it in your mind. And if you do, you'll be like trees planted along the river bank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. They do, but not the wicked. They are like worthless shaft scattered by the wind. So again, what's the long-term consequences of applying yourself to wisdom? You're like a tree by the river. When a drought comes, it doesn't affect you. You have a source of strength that others do not have. And then it says, let me make a whole bunch of observations about life. And you learn to do the same. So it says in chapter 15, a soft answer turns away anger. So if somebody comes to you and gets in your face and they're super angry, what's the best way to respond in order to to get it all sorted out? Is it to get back in their face and and have even greater anger? No, that just escalates into a fight. It says a soft answer. That is the best way to calm down a situation. Then it says a nagging partner is like a dripping roof. There's something about when you hear drip, drip, And once it's stuck in your head, you you can't help but hear it, and it starts to drive you crazy. It says that's what it's like to have a nagging person around. And then those who control their tongue will have a long life. Opening your mouth can ruin everything. Talking before you've thought it through leads to regrets. And then as surely as a north wind brings rain, so a gossiping tongue causes anger. Gossip ruins a whole bunch of things. A hard worker has plenty of food, but a person who chases fantasies has no sense. 
Somebody's always after some get-rich-quick scheme. Is a poor, poor person, but they're not going to work hard. You're just going to look for the next scheme. Then it says, I walked by the field of a lazy person, the vineyard of one with no common sense. I saw that it was overgrown with nettles. It was covered with weeds. Its walls were broken down. Then as I looked and thought about it, I learned this lesson. A little extra sleep, a little extra slumber, a little folding of my hands to rest, then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. So it says, make observations on life. And as you do that, you'll begin to see the truth about life. And then the final piece to gaining wisdom, and it ties back to the first one. Humility and surrender. That's what fear of the Lord also includes. It's God, you are the most important person in my life. You are the only one with perfect wisdom. I surrender my life to you to follow your design. Proverbs 3 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you the path to take. Wisdom. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. That's limbic brain stuff. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Well, that's just very briefly understanding that the Bible talks all about this wise mind, foolish mind that believes lies and gives us a path for how we can grow in wisdom. And I hope it just helps you and encourages you. Let's pray. Father, again, we often don't even realize the amount we believe lies and how much they control us and shape us and influence us. And I pray as we go through this series that you would just expose lies to each of us that we're believing, that are sabotaging our lives and our recovery, and that you give us the strength and the courage to believe the truth, and to act on it. Amen. Well, thank you again for being here with us this Friday. Hope you have a great weekend. We'll see you next week.